All right, hello everyone. My name is Mandy Goodset and I'm a librarian at Cleveland State University as well as our OpenCon Cleveland Planning Committee Chair. And I would like to welcome you to our final keynote for the OpenCon Cleveland 2022 event. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of the various lands on work, which we are working today, including the ones where I'm working, um, which include the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We pay our respects to Indigenous leaders past, present, and emerging, and we recognize and celebrate the diversity of Indigenous peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land on which we live. And I encourage everyone to learn more about the Native people of their own communities who have continued to steward these lands throughout generations. Um, I'm going to do a little introduction before our keynote because this is kind of when we have the most people all together. So I want to thank you so much for joining us for OpenCon Cleveland 2022, whether this is your first OpenCon Cleveland or your fifth. We hope that this has been an informative and fruitful event for you so far. Um, our OpenCon Cleveland Planning Committee worked really hard to put together um, an event that would be really useful for you with ideas that you could implement right away at your own institution. So very briefly, I just wanna explain why we call this event OpenCon. Um, so OpenCon is actually an organization. According to the website, it is a community of emerging leaders that has advanced open policies, launched projects and organizations, built new tools, fostered the adoption of open practices, and hosted events in 44 countries around the world. The OpenCon community's focus is not only on making research and education open, but also on ensuring that we create a fundamentally equitable future. And OpenCon is organized by SPARC, the Right to Research Coalition, and an organizing committee of students and early career academic professionals from around the world. So one of the exciting things that OpenCon does is it supports satellite events. So it has an international event, but it supports satellite events such as this one, which was organized by Cleveland State University and now several Ohio institutions. So if the topic of open education interests you, I encourage you to check out that international OpenCon organization. Now, um, I do have a few more very brief housekeeping things for you, but before I do that, I'm going to welcome Cleveland State University's Michael Schwartz Library Interim Director, Anne Marie Smiraldi, to give us some welcoming remarks if she is here. I am here, Mandy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual OpenCon Cleveland. We're delighted that you have chosen to be with us today and to participate in these different learning activities that have been offered. As Mandy already mentioned, this is an international event um, where you know, the satellite events allow the local communities to come together um, in a, a different way to share and uh, to facilitate open education and open access. This year's theme, Collaboration and Open Education, emphasizes the importance of working together to promote and advance open education and open access. I hope you've had the opportunity to view the lightning talks and engage in collegial conversation on Slack, where participants can share ideas, craft new initiatives, and discover the best way forward together. Today, we've enjoyed three wonderful synchronous sessions with ideas to get you started if you're new to open education or to provide you with fresh insights if you're already engaged in this work. Collaboration is what makes OpenCon Cleveland happen. Many CSU community members, including the Michael Schwartz Library, Law Library, Center for E-Learning, Center for Instructional Design and Distance Learning, the Student Government Association, faculty and administrators, help to coordinate this event. This year, for the first time, our planning team includes colleagues from the Ohio State University, Ohio Dominican, and Tri-C. I want to say thank you to the planning committee for making this all possible, uh, for bringing together so many states and different countries. And a big thank you to the presenters and participants. You are all champions for open education and open access. 
I hope you take some of the insights and ideas that this event has sparked and run with them. It's your collaborative efforts that will take open education to the next level. I hope you enjoy the rest of today's program. Now, Mandy, back to you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, all right. So just a couple of really quick things. If you're using social media to talk about the event, if you wouldn't mind using our hashtag OpenCon2022 Cleveland, we would appreciate it. We're recording this uh, keynote session and also the other sessions that we had today. And all of those will be added to Slack and to our website later. So if you'd like to share that with colleagues or if you missed anything, you can see that later. Um, our Slack space will remain up indefinitely after the event, but obviously we're not going to be actively managing it um, pretty much after today. So it's available to you. We encourage you to go there. Um, our speakers may or may not be available to, to chat with you, but I'm sure you can reach out to them with additional questions. So um, this year, in an effort to get folks using the Slack space, we are offering several prize drawings for participating in some of the channels. So please stick around until after our keynote to learn who those winners are. And if you were not into Slack and you still wanna win a prize, if you complete our post-event survey, you would be an eligible to win a $25 gift card for that as well. So we really, really uh, appreciate any feedback you can give us on this event. We always try to make it better every year and your feedback really helps us to do that. So um, really quickly before we introduce the keynote speaker, I wanted to thank this year's event planning committee members, Barb Loomis, Marsha Miles, Ben Richards, Laura Ray, Melanie Gagich, and Heather Capret from Cleveland State. And new this year, um, some committee members from other institutions as well. Uh, Anna Davis from Ohio Dominican University, Kevin Dranuski from Tri-C, and Amanda Larson from the Ohio State University. It was really, really wonderful having input from other colleagues um, from Ohio this year. And for all of the planners, you know, putting on an event like this requires a lot of work. And they put in a lot of work to make this a good event. So maybe please join me in giving them a virtual round of applause for the work that they've done. Um, I'd also like to thank Cleveland State University's Michael Schwartz Library for sponsoring our keynote speaker and OhioLink for sponsoring our prizes for this year. Thank you very much. Okay, now without further delay, I will introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Anita Waltz is Associate Professor at the University Libraries at Virginia Tech in her role as Assistant Director for Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian, she aims to inspire faculty to choose, adapt, create, and publicly share learning resources that are more accessible to students and more flexible to potential adapters. She holds a master's degree in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, fellow alum, and a bachelor's degree at econo in economics and philosophy from Wheaton College, and she has 20 years of experience working in international government, school, and academic libraries. She recently led a multi-institutional team of faculty and librarians from Virginia Tech and Cleveland State University to generate and review a shareable test bank resource for the open text textbook strategic management, which was a wonderful experience. Her research interests include library involvement in open educational resource initiatives, collaboration, library publishing, economics of higher education, and effective teaching practices for college age and adult learners. Um, I have really, really enjoyed working with Anita, and I consider her a mentor, and I think you are in for a treat. So thank you so much for joining us. Take it away, Anita. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and congratulations to uh, you and your committee. I know that planning these types of events is a whole lot of work, and I hope that you um, that you've you've just really enjoyed the work, but that you'll you'll benefit greatly from it. So um, 
this presentation uh, reflects my personal perspectives on valuing people and doing work that matters as applied to the area of open education. And I hope that you will be inspired by what collaborative partnerships can achieve in open education. I hope that you'll enjoy the interactivity and collaborative tools, hint, hint, um, used in this virtual environment. And I hope that you'll glean and share some ideas regarding collaborative methods. So if we were in a room together today, which we are not in a virtual room, I would ask you how many of you are new to open education? So you can raise your virtual hands, you can keep them down, whatever makes you happy. But I just wanna say welcome. Um, thank you for being brave and welcome. Collaboration is very near to the heart of open education and you've landed in, in a really great place in higher education where people are, are wanting to work together. So one could also argue that collaboration is central to the art of teaching and the challenge of learning. Learning is always from standing on someone else's shoulders through written and spoken words, through the use of others' methods and philosophies of exploration. It's social. Even if we're listening or reading on our own, we need others, whether um, those who have gone far, far earlier than us or whether it uh, we're getting content through our iPods or through Zoom, or we're sitting near someone in the same room. So with an eye toward collaboration, I want to tell you a little bit about my early days in open education. So I was new to open education in 2013. While I had worked as a librarian for over 10 years in, in international government and school libraries, this was my first job in higher education. And higher education was a very different animal than a very different context than any of the other places I had worked. The conversation about open education on my campus had no traction. As far as I could tell, there wasn't a listserv or the open education network or the different professional development programs that have fortunately sprung up since, um, to which many of you have been um, contributors. Um, this was a really new, a new area for me. Um, so what is my point here? <laughs> um, I had a couple people who were essentially on speed dial because I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought if I would make any progress in this new first job in an academic library, um, I could reach out to people, do some informational interviews. And so I got on the phone and I started calling a few different people and ended up with um, a mentor, um, Nicole Finkbeiner from OpenStax um, handled what felt to me like endless inquiries. Um, and she had worked at a community college before. She was working with OpenStax as their community liaison. And um, it was a really interesting relationship because here I was at an R1 and I brought all of these things that she that were new to her as well. But we worked together through a variety of experiences, um, um, experiments to bring together high-level administrators and open textbook display with tear off your tear off this card and tell your professor kinds of tools. Um, she visited Virginia on um, the coldest day of the year to speak at an on-campus conference, um, and she encouraged and listened to and challenged me. Um, my point here and this is how I felt at the time, was that um, no one learns alone, no one starts or works alone. And though it might seem at some point that, um, that you're a solo, you're the solo open ed librarian or instructional designer, you have six other jobs, um, maybe you teach in a classroom and um, that seems very solo. Um, the work of amplifying others' voices, of opening access to all learners, enabling creativity and agency for learners and instructors is far too big of a task for one person. 
And there's no one who sees all, all the sides of open education. So if you're under the impression that you can or should be the rugged individualist, um, I couldn't find a picture of the Marlboro man without a cigarette, so <laughs> you get boots instead. <laughs> um, I, I want to normalize the fact that we all very much need and can greatly benefit from collaborative ventures. Many of you already embody a collaborative outlook because of the culture that you grew up in, because of where you are now, or because of personal choices that you made. Um, so I want to, to, to just reiterate that uh, you may already have a lot of these experiences. Um, so I would like you to, I would like to invite you, um, as you may have already had a lot of collaborative experiences in open education, um, I would like to invite you to talk, uh, to, to add some of the things to the Google Jamboard, and the link is coming here in, uh, in the chat. Oops, I'm so sorry, I gave you two different links. Um, no, that's right. Thank you. Um, the first link is the Jamboard link, and what I would love for you to do is um, tell me a little bit about what kinds of collaborative things you have experienced in open ed, um, what kinds of things you might be looking forward to, so aspirations are welcome. Um, I'll talk through what's on this slide, but I, I want to show you um, first that uh, how to use Jamboard. So if you're in Jamboard, there is a sticky note here on the left. Um, can you see Jamboard on my screen? I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're going to click on the sticky note. It pops up a window. You can choose a color. You can type something in, press save. And when you're done, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, you can um, move your sticky note to um, to another place um, in on the screen. So some of the uh, I'm going to go back to my slides, but the um, please um, add some things on Jamboard, and I'm going to come back here. Um, some of the collaborative things that go on in uh, in open education. Um, relate to mentoring, collaborating to learn and do. Uh, some relate to strategic planning. Um, others relate to assessment-oriented collaborations, collaborations around making. So anything from uh, instructional or pedagogical tools, things that are crowdsourced, making OER, making test banks, making teaching guides, making videos, courseware. Um, there are collaborations around outreach. There are collaborations where students are leading, leading and you might be a recipient of something that students are, are doing as part of their learning. So um, giving you a minute to jot down some ideas and uh, just want to um, oops, I keep, keep going uh, a little bit too far. Okay, so uh, taught a world history course using an open ed textbook, collaborating across the library on affordability initiatives, creating informational newsletter about OER, working with subject library, subject liaisons to help curate OER. That's really great. Um, building out courses using open pedagogy, asking librarians to visit your classroom to teach students about Creative Commons. Um, these are all really um, right right on in terms of the kinds of things that um, that people are doing together so asking for yearly contributions or revisions to a programmatic open access textbook that's amazing um, collaborating with faculty to customize an open stacks text for a college success course so there are more starting to come in and i don't want to um, stop you um, Great OER committee for branch campus and the other schools and campuses, creating an OER lesson. Great. These are yeah. all really exciting things. Yes. While you're while people are answering that, there's some, I think there's a tapping noise or something, like something's unstable on your desk or something. Okay. Thank you for telling me. Yes, it's Is not hugely bad. Is that better? So far, yes. 
Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Carry on. No, I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to head back to the slides, but I will come back to this because I think it's it's really nice to see what sorts of um, what sorts of collaborations are aspirational or they're you're actually um, implementing. So I want to tell you a story. Um, a few years out of college, I rented a house with friends. And one afternoon I came home to long strands of torn cardboard and plastic all over the front steps and in the entryway. <laughs> what happened? Are you okay? I said to my frustrated looking housemate as I entered and took in the situation. I saw a new futon propped against the wall in the common room and large chunks of cardboard everywhere. Evidence of a long struggle with the heavy metal framed futon and cushion. You carried that? Unbeknownst to me, she had acquired the thing, gotten it into her car, transported it, unloaded it, drag it up a flight of stairs and through the front door. I don't remember exactly what she said, but I remember the sentiment. She said she never wanted to do that again by herself. And to my knowledge, she never did. Um, and please know no condemnation to her. She is a lovely, lovely person. But the story might sound familiar. Many of us do things like this when we think we can go it alone. And sometimes we're able to do things. Um, she succeeded, she got <laughs> into the apartment. Um, and, but, but, and sometimes we're mercifully intercepted. Sometimes we stop mid project. Sometimes we finish and we deal with the consequences, but hopefully, we learn about our limits from these kinds of experiences. And so while many tasks can be done by individuals, some are really best done collaboratively. They're a lot less overwhelming um, and they have some really great benefits. So working together can deepen working relationships and friendships. Um, it can deepen professional knowledge and um, just make things a lot more enjoyable. So. Um, I want to tell you another story. So during the early pandemic, I worked with a business faculty member here at Virginia Tech to adapt an existing open textbook for the strategic management class, um, which Mandy mentioned um, at Virginia Tech. And we publicly released the book in August 2020. It was used in a capstone course that fall. So I was in touch with the team that worked on the book. And somehow it came to my attention that the course coordinator, Eli Jamison, was rightfully worried about having not enough assessment tools for a very large number of students she was expecting in the spring, 700 to be specific. Um, and she was undertaking a test bank development project, having students write questions as part of an assignment and then using them for the spring course. So I had collaboratively created a test bank before, not with students, but with faculty. And I knew a few things about how much work she was starting to take on, especially regarding quality control, copy editing, making the files useful, um, the types of tasks that would be really necessary to ensure the test bank is, is usable. I had overlooked planning for those things after this the first test bank project I worked on with Fundamentals of Business. So I was worried about how much work Eli was taking on. I also knew that such ancillaries are really helpful for enabling instructors to actually adopt open course materials. So around the same time, and I don't know if she's here, if you are, say hi. Um, around the same time, I received a notification from a business faculty member at Cleveland State University, Dr. Candace Vandervoort, who, who indicated interest in the book and maybe building some ancillary materials. The book had a, um, a form within it uh, where faculty who were reviewing or adopting could tell us if they're interested in um, if they're reviewing or adopting and they're interested in building ancillaries and that sort of thing. Uh, and Candace um, uh, filled out the form. So with Eli's permission, I invited her to join in a conversation about potentially collaborating with us. I thought this would provide a lot more support to Eli and um, it was of stated interest to Candace. So um, we worked together for um, about a year um, we, um, the, I won't go into the details, but um, 
we had a lot of help from our students, from internal review, from the CSU team, um, and a lot of back and forth. We also worked with a professional copy editor. Um, we had some um, contact with the university legal and um, needed money to pay um, pay people for certain things. Um, so we released the test bank in a secure environment in um, September 2021. Um, and while Eli could have done this work on her own, it would have taken a lot more work. It would have taken a lot more time. It would have been a lot less fun. Um, I think our team really gelled. Um, and it wouldn't have been a shareable resource that others could benefit from. So, um, and you'll also see Mandy was involved. And so um, this is how Mandy and I uh, got to know each other better. And it, it was really a joy. So my point is, you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to, if you see others who are going it alone, and they are possibly interested in uh, working on something together, um, go for it. So okay, so uh, what is collaboration? So of course, I <laughs> I went to the Oxford English Dictionary just because I can, um, and I knew that the co, co is with, and labor is obviously part of this word. So uh, collaboration is um, to labor together toward an end, to toward a particular end. Um, so this is multiple stakeholders um, working together with a shared purpose. And while literary and artistic production is part of this definition, um, I like to have a broader viewpoint regarding collaboration as nearly any of the tasks that we listed on the Jamboard could really benefit from collaboration. So I want to walk through a few examples of um, collaboration that are relevant for higher education. My perspective is as a librarian, but I'm trying to step away from that a little bit to say these are not just librarian instructor, librarian instructor student um, collaborations, but student led faculty disciplinary collaborations, those involving instructional design. So trying to take a, a really broad view. And um, as I am talking, um, I know that you are aware of lots of different projects in um, in your fields, um, and maybe the conversation will spark some some ideas or things that you want to share. So I want to invite you to. Um, oh, the tapping is still going away. I'm so sorry. Um, is it still tapping? Right now. I think it's when you move. There's. I don't know if your laptop is hitting the wall or something. I'm so sorry, Anita. <laughs> Woodpeckers at large, so sorry. Okay, so I'll try to be still. How's that? <laughs> so sorry. Do your best. Tiny woodpeckers. Um, <laughs> okay, um, sorry. Uh, so there's a link that I think I just put in the chat and you are invited to add if you know of other examples that you wanna share with the group. Um, that could be a really, um, that's a really fun um, thing that you can do. Um, so yes, thank you for that link. Oh, all right. So here are some um, examples. So I've been working with a team of faculty on a series of of medical textbooks. If you're squeamish, please don't, please don't worry. There is no anatomy here. Um, and one of the issues we've had to deal with is finding openly licensed clinical images that we can use in the book. Um, for example, if you need to show an x-ray of lungs or a photo showing a particular pathology that is inside someone's body as opposed to um, something outside, um, those are really difficult to find. They're not readily available. Um, but my colleagues were actually able to find a uh, collaborative environment um, called Radiopedia. It's a, it's a wiki and it's an openly licensed, publicly available wiki where clinical, uh, clinically trained and vetted um, people, medical people add text and they release openly licensed clinical images. The contributions are vetted and added to the site. 
Um, this particular article has been revised 91 times by 22 vetted clinicians. So such expert peer review sources of openly licensed clinical images, imagery have been absolutely invaluable for this series of books. Um, so I don't know very much about this site. I don't know who's working on this and who's contributing to it, but it has been something that was very, very helpful for, um, for the work that, um, that we've been doing. Um, another example, um, enabling students, uh, the next couple slides are about enabling students sharing and collaboration as part of credit bearing courses. So those of you who are teaching um, courses, um, yeah, um, those of you who are teaching courses may know about the Open Pedagogy Notebook. This is a great resource um, for um, examples of how other people have been um, teaching um, openly. Uh, Dr. Karen Kangalasi is the is a biology professor at Keene State College, and she's the program director for Open Education Global's Regional Leaders of Open Education Community. Um, Dr. Kangalasi uses contract grading, a variety of learning opportunities, lectures, discussion, lab ac activities. Um, to enable students to take ownership of how they learn, what they learn, and where they communicate what they're learning with considerations of local, regional, and global ramifications of their work. They connect their learning with social issues, they use and create openly licensed resources, and they share using open science principles. So they're sharing research ideas, hypotheses, methodology, and data with the scientific community. Um, to, and they gain feedback from that community. So this is a faculty uh, who is encouraging students to collaborate with people outside of the university by sharing and getting feedback um, from, from the larger community. Um, another set, this is a set of projects at Virginia Tech. Um, these have involved students as authors as another, also as part of credit bearing courses. I want to point out especially the foundations of hip hop encyclopedia, which was written by Virginia Tech students enrolled in Dr. Kwame Harrison's uh, and librarian Craig Arthur's course on hip hop. Uh, a very recent, this just came out about a month ago, um, or teaching in the university. Uh, learning from graduate students and early career faculty is written by 22 graduate students and recent grads who are part of the graduate teaching scholar program in the College of Ag and Life Sciences at Virginia Tech. So this project was uh, was edited by a faculty lead with two of her recent students and had collaborators who are current grad students and those who had just graduated and have gone on to become faculty or, or do um, work after their, their master's or their doctorate is finished. Um, this was a pandemic project. So it was, we started right before the pandemic and um, it was, it was a really interesting, um, yeah, it was a really interesting experience. There is really wonderful content in this book. But both of these projects benefited from collaborations between faculty and their students or recent grads. They benefited from collaboration between the library and these faculty or recent grads. Um, and they also involved some early career faculty who were, um, who were also involved in leading the, pro leading the project. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about faculty to faculty uh, collaborations. Um, there are various platforms that people are using to organize the work that they are doing within their disciplines and to share it, um, to um, connect instructors from within their disciplines um, to people who are far outside of, of open education, but may want to know what kinds of things are going on. Um, so for example, did you know that there is a ver very active group of early childhood education instructors um, that are led by Jennifer Paris from College of the Canyons and Amanda Tantor from Reedley College? 
Um, they're located in California, but they have um, hosted a three different early childhood education OER summits to get their um, subject matter experts together. They are in the process of creating eight open textbooks for major areas in early childhood education. And they have um, several different, um, they're working on um, a lot of, let's see, I will put in, in the chat the link for, for their, their presentation on the summits, but they, um, their Google site is, is a really interesting place for um, sharing and um, talking within that, that community. Thank you. Um, okay, chatting while I try to talk. <laughs> um, a few different, um, a few other disciplinary um, connections include the Open Social Work Project, which is run by Matt DiCarlo um, from La Salle University, um, the Philosophy um, series of nine books by Christine Hendricks um, is um, something that has used the Rebus platform. Um, this is a great place to go if you're looking for to crowdsource elements of a production process of a, of a creation process for learning materials, specifically open textbooks. So, uh, and then the there are some curation projects within disciplines that are faculty to faculty where organizations such as uh, AIM, the American Institution, Institute of Mathematics has identified a list of um, open textbooks, they've reviewed them, they've uh, against some evaluation criteria, and then they've, um, they have approved some of them for use in class. So you might wonder, um, your next question might be how and why do these kinds of things work? And um, I want to argue that everybody brings something to the table, that um, you are the gift, your experiences, your expertise, even your vulnerability about not knowing things, um, also your willingness to speak up, these are all parts of what make collaborative ventures work. Um, so two really quick stories. Um, one, I was involved with a church plant when I lived in Washington, DC. And while it was growing, it was really small and everybody still knew each other for quite a long time. It's very much shaped by the people who showed up. And one of the leaders told me one time, Every time somebody new shows up, I am reminded that they are a gift. <laughs> it was like being told here, you needed this. Um, so there were people that that group needed for their perspective, their relative strengths, even their weaknesses. And it made me really excited to get to know new people uh, and to find out what kind of contribution they would make. So that's really stuck with me. Um, and then growing up where and when I did, I had some mentalities to shed and some of the most meaningful, impactful experiences I've had have come from people who spoke up to challenge an attitude or uh, an unthought through position that I was taking on something. And so collaborations really need people who will speak up and say what they see and challenge the process. So everyone, even the newest, most junior person brings something to the collaboration. Um, I want to talk a little bit about nuts and bolts of how organizing collaborative ventures work, and then I want to close with um, with a few um, a few other remarks. So, I am a big proponent of form follows function. If you have done any work in architecture, you might know that um, you build buildings for a purpose, and so building tools for their specific purpose is. Uh, is, I think, logical, <laughs> um, but it also means that maybe you're not using something that's right off the shelf, um, but that you, you're you using what you have and you're making it work. So I'm going to share with you some of my favorites, just the, the theory of them. Some have illustrations, some do not, but um, in the Test Bank Collaborative Project between Virginia Tech and Cleveland State, we used a task matrix that's similar to one that's actually on the board behind me. Um, the categories being, here are our ideas. Here are things we decided, yes, we will do. Here are the things that we're doing or we're working on. 
And these are the things that are done. Um, then at the bottom, you see those categories of not doing and waiting on, because there are those things that you take on and you say, wait, we don't need to do this. Um, so put them in the not doing category. Um, what was fun was to move things from the left side slowly to the right and to see, oh, we are making progress. Um, so we use this in every meeting and it really helped us, I think, to focus and to document some of the um, issues and our plans and to move the work forward. Uh, secondly, um, I tend to take a lot of notes on projects and when there are emails, there are meetings or conversations or phone calls, it's all in different places. So I need a central place to jog my memory. What was the burning issue we decided to table in our last meeting? And did I mention that we needed to make a decision about, you know, the schedule date or when the, the, the budget report is due? I just, I can't remember things um, from project to project. And so having a log of what we communicated with in our team, um, what decisions we made, um, notes really to myself, and this is internal, my collaborators never see it, <laughs> um, but it's really helpful to me to, to feel more organized. Um, I use a dashboard. So I usually build um, project a dashboard for projects where there are lots of moving parts. So when student um, peer reviewers are working on chapters, I ask them to use a dashboard so that both they and I can quickly check to see, did we already talk about chapter 10? Did the reviewers upload all their documents? When is chapter 12 ready? It just makes it easier to look at one place where there's a, a good summary of information. Um, and finally, um, I'm, I'm listing a blank screen for, oops, Okay, that slide went away. <laughs> um, the next slide is supposed to have a checklist on it, um, but the projects that I work on tend to have a lot of detailed things to take care of. So some collaborators are more organized than others and some are less organized uh, or they're just too busy. So from time to time projects can get to a stage where things are at risk of being overlooked or are starting to actually get overlooked. Um, so usually with a colleague, I write down all the details. <laughs> just list everything out. We did this this week actually with one project, all the details that need to be addressed into a giant list. Then we organize it, we figure out who's responsible for what, and we identify timelines, and we try to make some sense out of, out of the, the process um, if something has gotten derailed. So um, many of my ideas around collaboration um, especially the social part of it have come from seeing others lead meetings or workshops. Um, the Open Education Network has been fabulous for learning, uh, learning from how to do these kinds of things. I also want to give a shout out to the Liberating Structures um, resource. This is a menu of 33 activities for running more inclusive teams and meetings with goals to break through the, the feeling of disengagement in meetings and teams and sparking a more effective or engaging um, collaborative conversation. Uh, and then from a different playbook, um, a consensus building strategy for large groups that I found to be really successful and fun and social if it's done in person involves a lot of sticky notes. Um, so I don't know if other people love sticky notes, but I think they're great. Um, so in a virtual environment, I've also done this in Trello, which you can see on the right hand side, not quite as easy to talk through why something fits with something else. But um, so the way it that that it works is the meeting leader explains the purpose of the activity and shares a set of prompts. For example, what are the main goals of this, I don't know, newly proposed product or service? Who is it for? Why might people try to use it? What does it actually do? What functionality is critical to it being a successful contribution? And so participants are encouraged to write down on as many sticky notes as they can um, responses to these questions within a given time. Uh, and then they're to group the notes by similarity. Um, so 
there's a lot of um, a lot of discussion about can you tell us what this meant? Um, um, a, a lot of there's a lot of consensus when a lot of people write the same thing, um, but there's also a place for the things that maybe only one person wrote um, to put some importance on those. So this kind of activity allows people both to be um, anonymous to some degree, and it removes some of the reasons that we don't speak up in groups. Okay, and then um, finally, I want to say that um, collaboration is not without personal and interpersonal effort. Um, we collaborate in order to bring people together. Um, we collaborate to build motivation and a sense of teamwork. And it requires um, building both familiarity and trust. It reminds, um, it enables us to remind each other that each person is really valuable and their contributions are very valuable, um, that we really want to hear from them. Um, collaboration also has a way of forcing you to resolve conflicts. So if you have to work together because you are trying to reach a common goal, you have to resolve your issues. <laughs> You have to figure out how to communicate with each other. You have to have to work through whatever the, the disagreement is. Um, you have to learn to respect each other, um, even if you have a different um, perspective. Um, collaboration can be really fun. Sometimes we collaborate just to support each other and to um, provide um, help during hard tasks. Um, sometimes we collaborate to um, learn from each other. Um, and, and as you've already seen, we collaborate with um, the, um, with effort towards shared purposes and productive ends. Um, sometimes we collaborate with unexpected collaborators in order to break the mold and the preconceived ideas of how something should be done or who should be doing it. Um, so this is especially true and we want to make the point that every person is valuable and each person bring, brings gifts to the collaboration in the form of their perspective, their experience, and their person. Um, so in closing, I, I hope that you will, um, I'm going to take a look at the, at, um, the Excel document or the, um, the spreadsheet, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this gives you some encouragement. Oh, okay, we don't have anything. So you're putting things in there and you've been listening patiently. That's fine. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that this, this gives you um, encouragement to, um, to work with one another, to um, dig into the, the wonderful colleagues that are in this space and to find ways to make your projects really thrive and to enjoy doing them as you, as you work. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you um, today. And um, I'm happy to um, hear your questions. I'm also happy to talk with you offline if that's um, more helpful, um, but feel free to chat or I don't know, Mandy, if you want to um, have people unmute or not, but I'll let you decide that. Whatever, whatever people would like to do. Does anyone have any questions for Anita? I, I feel like your story of your roommate who was pulling the, the futon up the stairs really resonated with me. I think <laughs> a lot of us do that where we're just like, no, I'm going to get this. But if we just let go and and ask for help and work with others, it just goes so much more smoothly. Yeah, it does. It really does. Um, so I think there's, I'm so sorry. I don't know if this tapping has gone, has the tapping gone away? It went away. So it went away. Okay, so I just took my hands off my desk. I'm so sorry about that. Who knows? <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, yeah, I, I think the tendency, um, at, at least, you know, when you care about something that you really want it to work and you really want it to, um, to move forward. And, um, but it's, you know, asking for help and calling people like the, um, 
the story I told about Nicole being kind of on my modern day speed dial um, was really formative. There is no way I would have been able to um, move forward and to learn as much as I did without having somebody to, to bounce things off of. I wonder if you could just talk briefly about, um, cause this is something that came up when we collaborated, just like having how different institutions or different people have different resources and how working together can end up benefiting people who don't have a lot of resources to do their yeah. project. Yeah. So, it, and honestly, I think it goes both ways. <laughs> um, I don't want to say CSU is in the not very resourced. Um, Candace came to us and she, she had funding to do work um, for herself, which was wonderful. Um, I had some expertise. Um, Candace knew of, uh, had, a, had a GA or a, a TA who knew how to put everything into this format that was so much easier than what I had done before and putting things in respondus. Um, I think the, um, both you and Candace brought an understanding of the accreditation issues at your campus that I was not aware of and not being in an academic department, I didn't know um, what kinds of things were going on in, in my department, um, or, or sorry, were going on in the business department in, um, at Virginia Tech. So I think the, the combination of things that people brought was what made it work. Um, and it, it, was, it was really all hands on deck. It's like, let's, let's see if we can do this. Let's figure out what it takes and let's try to move forward. Um, it, yeah, it was real. It was it was great. Um, so it was a lot of fun <laughs> to work with you guys. So. And a great final product too. Yes, yes. Um, and I can put a link for the the test bank. Yeah, that would be notes. great. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So maybe I'll ask one more quick question. Okay. okay. If like I could imagine people listening and thinking, well collaboration would be nice, but like, I don't even know where to begin collaborating with others. Like, how do I even make the first step? Um, and I'm kind of thinking of others being other institutions, but I guess it could be others in your own institution. It can be hard even to connect at that level. Yeah. Yeah, I think being specific. So Jasmine Kirby asks in the, the chat, is anyone here looking to collaborate? So um, first step being asking, um, but, but ask for specifics and find somebody who you think might, you know, might you already know um, something about this topic or might you be interested in learning more about a particular topic? Uh, I. I'm in a situation right now where we're going to be working on a book with musical scores in it. And I don't know anything about publishing with mu publishing musical scores. How do you make them look clean and crisp? Um, how do you make sure that you have, can you include text on the same page as you're putting music? Um, so I, what I did was, um, we were really, so it's myself and then two faculty, one from here, one from another institution. And um, they know all about the software for composing music and typesetting it and how that process works. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if people are still using Finale Notepad. Um, we're probably, you know, I'll, I can talk more about that later, but um, so, there's a project I was aware of that is called the public domain anthology, songbook anthology or something like that. And so I thought, well, I can contact the people who did this and see if they will talk to me <laughs> about what they did. Um, so we have a call set up for next week to kind of pick their brains. Um, and um, when I've done this before, for example, with the very first test bank project I worked on, 
Um, I, I got my plan together. I was like, I think we're going to do this. This is, these are, you know, here's our timeline. Here's, these are our goals. This is what kind of organization. So I, I did as much as I could to organize my project. And then I, I brought it to somebody who I knew had done this. And I said, I'm thinking about doing this project. Would you be willing to talk through what I have planned already and, and help me see where the gaps are? Because I, I'm not sure how to do this. And, and I already knew, I don't know how to write test items. <laughs> that are rigorous and like, that's not my training. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how to organize lots of people in a really structured path so we actually get something done. And um, so I called, I, I um, emailed someone and I said, I, I see that you've done this before. Would you have a few minutes to talk with me about your project? And, um, and that person said, actually, I would be happy to mentor you through this. And I just about fell out of my chair. So there are people like that in the, the open education field who um, really want to share what they know and um, want to contribute in those kinds of substantive ways. I didn't expect that. I wouldn't, norm I wouldn't expect that generally, um, but I was so grateful because it was support that I really needed and it made a big difference. Um, yeah, how to get connected, how to get started. I think have an idea of what you want to accomplish. And then um, one thing that we do is with the, the open textbooks that we have, we ask people if they're using it or they're reviewing it or they're considering using it to tell us um, in this form. And so if you can find out who else is interested and see if people want to work together, that's a great way. Um, the Rebus community is also a great um, place to, to post your project, um, indicate where you are in your, your project development process. and. Um, you know, issue a call for we need reviewers, we need um, student or um, student reviewers, faculty reviewers, we need um, help with um, building an index or a copy editing or, or things that, you know, that maybe you don't know how to do, don't want to do, can't do. Um, but there's a, a very healthy crowdsourcing um, community in Rebus. Um, and then in, in um, the chat, Heather also said the Open Education Network is a great resource for collaboration. So I think it takes stepping out and saying, I don't know how to do this, or I'm trying to do this and I'm not sure. Um, it just somebody know. <laughs> um, and it, it takes putting yourself out there and being a little bit vulnerable about what you don't know. Um, so I, I think it's hard. Um, because there's a lot, you know, it's hard to admit when you don't know something and, um, but there's, there are people who do know things and, and they're generally really happy to, um, if you present something that's like as much as you can possibly do and um, that you have a plan um, that they're, I think willing to comment on that. That's easier to comment on than than um, uh, just starting from scratch. How do I do this? Well, <laughs> do as much as you can, and then come back to me, and and we'll look at what you did because maybe you did something really cool that's even better than an approach that you know somebody else may have taken. So, um, yeah, that would be my advice. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anita, for a very inspiring talk. I think um, the subject of collaboration is so important, and I've got some great ideas from this. So everyone, please join me in thanking Anita. Yeah. Um, before we go, we are going to announce the, our prize winners. So if you might be a prize winner, then you should stick around. Um, and please do not forget to fill out our survey. Uh, maybe before you leave today, if you have a chance, just get it done. Um, thank you all so much for attending. And thank you again, Anita. I'm gonna turn it over to Heather to announce our prize winners. 
Um, so this is the time we've all been waiting for. Um, in the announcements, we posted that there would be a random drawing from the participants in each of the four social channels for a $25 prize. Uh, the prizes will be awarded as a choice of gift cards. The library fiscal agent, Tracy Kemp, will be in touch with the winners by email to get your choice and distribute an e-gift card. So for the Social Dance Party channel, our winner is Dana Knott from Columbus State Community College for her salt and pepper shoop post. And for the Introductions channel, the winner is Sue Puccio from Palo Alto College in scorching hot San Antonio, Texas. It was 102 degrees Fahrenheit the day she posted. For the Office Trinkets channel, our winner is Joseph Dudley from Bryant and Stratton College for his post of his pencil holder from Africa and a small statue of Buddha from India. And we have to say we really loved his coffee mugs too. Keep them going. <laughs> and for the winner of the Snack Table channel, we had Simon Ringsmith from Oklahoma State University for his post of his drawer full of chunky soups. And Simon, if you come to Cleveland, we really need to take you out to lunch someday. Um, we also had a Wordle contest in which participants had to guess the words for three Wordles. We added up the number of guesses and the person with the lowest number is our winner. And that person is Sarah Sangregorio from Mount Clare State University in New Jersey, and she'll be getting a $75 gift card. So please do keep your eye out for the follow-up survey on your experience at OpenCon Cleveland. We do have one more drawing, a random drawing for a $25 gift card for the people that uh, submit those surveys. Uh, congratulations to all the winners. Again, watch your email for a message from Tracy Kemp. T. Kemp at csuohio.edu. And if there are no other comments from my conference co planners, this concludes the OpenCon Cleveland 2022 conference. We hope to see you next year, and everyone have a fantastic weekend.